Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher. He was a student of Socrates and later a teacher of Aristotle, all of which were of the Greek aristocracy, giving them the status and time to discuss and write about justice, beauty, equality, aesthetics, political philosophy, theology, and cosmology. Plato would go on to found his own institution of higher learning, as well as write many of his own works, generally in the dialogue format of the time period. However, much of the primary sources of the time period did not survive the passage of time, and have instead been constructed by scholars through his writings, as well as the writings of contemporaries and classical historians. Some of the resulting works include The Republic, Phaedio, The Symposium, Timaeus, and so on. However, the focus of this video will be on Plato's Timaeus. Hello, my name is Anthony Torres. I am a mechanical engineering student at Drexel University, and for this video I'll be discussing Plato's Timaeus for my History of Ancient Sciences research project. Let's get right into it. Unlike many other dialogues of this period in time, Timaeus remains only as the traditional dialogue during the introductory portion of the text. Within this section, the characters are introduced, which include Socrates, Timaeus, Critias, and Hippocrates. The individuals begin by mentioning a reply to Socrates' speech given the previous day, discussing an ideal political arrangement much like that of the Republic. The reply would begin with an account of the creation of the universe and would then lead into the discussion of an ideal society in motion. And the focus of this project is on Timaeus' account of creation. Once the characters and context were provided, the account of creation begins with a rather long monologue by Timaeus himself. However, it does not proceed as any typical dialogue. In fact, it proceeds as a very likely account of the generation of the cosmos itself, as well as the generation of human nature. Timaeus' dialogue can be broken down further into its respective parts, the first of which is the account by Nous, otherwise known as intellect. It is here that the making of the cosmos occurs. The next part is the account by necessity, which introduces the receptacle in order to address problems with the first account. The third and final part of this monologue combines the prior two accounts to discuss the cooperation of intellect and necessity and spends time largely on the psychophysical creation of human beings by the lesser created gods. The scope of the account of creation still at this point remains too vast for this project. So digging deeper into this section of Timaeus, I'll be discussing Plato's descriptions of creation by the Demiurge, otherwise known as the Divine Craftsman. This Divine Craftsman is responsible for the construction of the cosmos, however the means by which he does so is what is critical within the text. Now, mathematics held a significant role within Greek and other ancient societies, and has been a major area of study for those peering into our past. Unlike many of these other quantitative analyses, I found particular interest in taking a more qualitative approach in analyzing how it is that the Demiurge in Plato's Timaeus is capable to create the cosmos. But prior to discussing the means by which the Demiurge creates the cosmos, understanding the quote-unquote supplies he has available to him is essential. The world's body is composed of four elements. Fire for visibility, earth for tangibility. However, the other two elements act to mediate fire and earth, and these elements are air and water. Now, although these elements are being mentioned now, I would also like to reassure you that I will be delving into the construction of these elements themselves later on. Within the text, it is discussed how the Demiurge is able to create the cosmos, and how his motivation to do so is because of his desire to make the cosmos as good as possible. However, critical to this statement is that the Demiurge is not able to create the cosmos in any way he would desire. In fact, within the quote from the text, the words, so far as this was attainable, imply even constraints on the divine craftsman himself. Based upon this, he would face at least two major constraints when creating the cosmos. The first constraint of which is encountered is that he is unable to initiate change between things that are similar in nature. This can be seen within the text when Timaeus states the following. Now, to better understand what this means and why it is a constraint even the Demiurge faces, an understanding of nature and conditions of rest and motion is required. Timaeus discusses how motion is never going to be possible in what remains uniform. Without a distinct and separate mover and moved when considering the uniform, there will be no motion. This same principle also applies to the patterns or forms the Demiurge uses in his construction of the cosmos. These patterns are described to be self-identical and uniform, and according to this principle of the impossibility for the uniform to have motion, the patterns never change or disappear. Simultaneously, this means that the patterns cannot affect change in other patterns without something to generate inequality. What this would go on to suggest is that the Demiurge is required to mix different types of things or elements in order to construct a cosmos. 
However, this mixing is not so simple and possesses its own constraints. On the contrary to the first constraint, the second is how that the mixing of elements is particularly challenging given that the different elements tend to separate or even act to destroy one another. For instance, fire is generally considered more destructive than the other three elements. This can be seen when Timaeus states the following. When one of the other elements is fastened upon by fire and is cut by the sharpness of its angles and sides, it coalesces with the fire and then ceases to be cut by them any longer. Now that I've established fire as being the most destructive of the elements, I'll discuss what interactions between the elements look like based upon the constraints placed on the Demiurge. Although interactions between the elements is generally destructive, especially that of fire's interactions, earth is actually the least affected by interactions with other elements. Whereas water and air would be reduced to their component triangles when interacting with fire, as I'll be discussing shortly, earth would instead be separated into individual earth particles. Timaeus describes the interactions of water and air with fire as follows. Water, when divided by fire or by air, on reforming may become one part fire and two parts air, and a single volume of air divided becomes two of fire. Now, for the sake of clarity, let me share with you what is being discussed. If an air particle were to be reduced by fire, it would then be separated into the components necessary to make two fire particles. Similarly, if water is divided by either fire or air, it would reform to become one part fire and two parts air. After considering the two constraints, one could question how creation could even be possible according to the text. What Plato utilizes to evade these constraints when describing how the Demiurge creates the cosmos is proportion. To understand proportion in the context of the text, we must first discuss the three main functions of proportion. Understanding each of the three functions will then allow us to form a more complete picture as to how the Demiurge creates the cosmos utilizing proportion despite the primary two constraints on him. The first of the functions of proportion is division, which is utilized during the creation of the world soul. Notably within the text, Timaeus mentions proportion during the creation of the body, however he does later state in the text how the soul was created prior to the body. In order to begin the creation of the world soul, the mixing of the eternal and the indivisible with the changing and divisible types of three kinds, being the same and other, is required. After compounds of each kind have been formed, he proceeds to mix the three compounds together to form a new mixture. However, the soul had yet to be produced by this point. The mixture result is instead implied to be perfectly uniform, which based upon the constraints previously stated indicates that no change or motion can be associated with the mixture. The uniformity of the original mixture can be further supported when the mixture used to create the human soul is contrasted with the original mixture by stating they, as in the human soul mixture, were not, however, pure as before, but diluted to the second and third degree. Now that it can be seen that the original mixture is perfectly uniform, the next step the Demiurge must take when constructing the world soul is to divide the original mixture to produce a plurality from an undifferentiated one. However, he does more than just divide up the mixture, he must divide the mixture up into pieces that differ from one another, for without such there could be no motion or change, rather. One may think he would divide the mixture randomly, however he does not. Instead, he divides it into two series of lengths, such that the members of each series are related by definite proportions to pieces of the same series. From there, he goes on to subdivide it further in order for there to be proportions among the pieces, as can be seen in the following quote from the text. But the question still remains, why would the Demiurge divide it proportionally instead of randomly? However, as good of a question as this remains, within Timaeus, no reason is provided to support the presence of proportionate division. Instead, it is only made clearer as to why this was necessary when looking at the second function of proportion. The second function of proportion, much like the third function, invokes means of unity. The second function specifically pertains to the creation of the world body, because the world body is not actually eternal, instead being something having come into existence made of both fire and earth. However, based on the constraints we have discussed at this point, it can be seen that the need of the two elements alone presents an issue, because the two cannot coexist on their own. For the sake of clarity, let us recall that fire and earth do not mix, and at best fire will dissolve the earth into individual earth particles, which separate from the fire, or at worst, earth destroys the fire. At this point, we have introduced the four elements, yet only mentioned fire and earth, necessary for the construction of the world body. Both water and air are utilized to overcome this challenge the Demiurge faces when presented with fire and earth. More generally, Timaeus states that two things cannot be rightly put together, Without a third, there must be some bond of union between them. Therefore, it appears that for any sort of unity to be generated between fire and earth, a proportion is required. 
Proportions have the unique ability to provide a middle term resulting in relationships between the proportion and the two things it binds. Timaeus goes on to describe the relationship between the middle term of any three numbers, and a simple example depicting that is as follows. However, when discussing this relationship, he does not go on to describe the middle term and its relationship to the other terms. Instead, he only states that the middle term has the relationship to the first term that the third term has to the middle term. What this shows is that the middle term has something in common with each of the other terms, but what is highlighted by Timaeus is the bond between the two other terms to the middle term, for it is the relationship of identity between the relationships of the middle term with the first and the third terms, which is proportion. This proportion does not allow for the two differing terms to only join by likeness, but instead to join because of their participation in a relationship which in turn is united with the relationship of the other by virtue of its sameness to that other relationship. Based upon this statement, you may question then why both water and air are necessary instead of a single element. However, Timaeus goes on to address this when discussing the universal frame as shown. With earth, fire, and its two intermediates between them to support unity, the four elements can be composed into the world body. Returning to the first function of proportion, it can be seen that the second function of unity anticipates the need to reunite the pieces after proportionate division of the uniform mixture from which the body is created. The last of the functions of proportion is to unite the entities that appear largely similar but separate in order to effect change. Therefore, the third function acts similarly to the first and second function, but ultimately aims to unite the elements unlike the world body per the second function. As of this moment, I have discussed the elements and how the demiurge is able to construct the cosmos given these elements. However, understanding the third function of proportion is best understood by looking at the creation of these elements from triangles. Within ancient science, many individuals had differing beliefs on the fundamental form of matter. Some, such as Thales of Miletus, believing all to be composed of waters, or others believing everything to be comprised of the primary elements fire, earth, air, and water. However, Plato believed these primary elements to be transmutable and recombined into different types of bodies. By denying primary elements incapable of transmutation, he considers their intelligible form. The intelligible form he describes is one that derives from two elementary triangles which are taken as two irreducible elements for the construction of the four primary solids of the cosmos. Much like when the Demiurge created the world soul, the issue of uniformity makes it challenging to create because of the inability to invoke change in the uniform. When considering triangles, it is worth noting that they are alike enough to prevent them from affecting change in spite of the fact that they are separable. Timaeus describes the triangles as mathematically similar, meaning they share the same angles as well as the same ratios to describe their side lengths. Additionally, it is worth noting when considering these triangles that they are indeed planar, Contrasting to these triangles, the elements exist as solids with depth in addition to length and width. What this shows us is that the triangles lack one of the defining principles of the elements they are supposed to form. Therefore, some change must be necessary to go from two dimensions to three dimensions. However, like the constraints of uniformity, similar triangles are unable to make this change of dimension on their own. Much like a geometric solid is comprised of planar faces, the triangular planes are capable of combining to form planes but are unable of still producing complete solids through simple means of combination. This then requires the Demiurge's intervention through which he introduces form and number so that the solid shapes may also provide their properties. In other words, these solid shapes constructed exist as elements rather than the planar triangles used to construct them. Having covered the constraints the Demiurge faces, as well as the functions that proportion serves, we can see how it is, according to Plato's philosophy, that the Demiurge is able to construct the cosmos in Timaeus. Proportion is essential for the Demiurge to overcome the constraints he faces, and it is nearly paradoxical that proportion is what allows him to use compatibility between like things to generate inequality between them. Circling back even to the Demiurge's desire to effect good, it is the ability for him to produce something different from what originally existed in the universe which is critical for him to effect good. Defining this good, however, is best understood when thinking that what existed prior to the Demiurge's interference was without intelligence and therefore not good. It was the task of the Demiurge to bring order to the cosmos by making all things to be as good and as fair as possible, which as stated before is done through his ability to construct an intelligible form of the cosmos. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you found some interest in the snippet of knowledge covered in this work of Plato's, I highly suggest you pick it up and give it a read. Thanks for watching.